Frank Thompson was born in India in 1920. He was the son of Edward Thompson, an English Methodist missionary, and Theodosia Jessup, who had been born in Syria to an American Presbyterian missionary family. Frank's parents returned to England when he was three years old and settled in Oxford. His father wrote many books on India and was a widely recognized expert on Indian affairs. Young Frank grew up in an intellectual household infused with politics. Frank's younger brother, Edward Palmer, or E.P. Thompson, would go on to become perhaps the most famous social historian of the 20th century. As fascism spread across Europe in the 1930s, Frank Thompson followed the Leipzig trial of the Bulgarian Georgi Dimitrov in Germany, who defended himself against Hitler's accusation that the communists had set fire to the Reichstag. Thompson was also deeply influenced by the deaths of his best friend's two older brothers, both who had fought in the international brigades on the Republican side of the Spanish Civil War. My father was a professor of philosophy at Oxford, and Frank's father was a famous novelist and journalist, particularly concerned with India. And to both houses, many interesting people used to come. And I am thinking in uh, Frank's boyhood, Nehru, Pandit Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi came to the house, and many other political people, and to my home, many famous intellectuals came. And so Frank and my youngest brother, Brian, uh, were brought up in this atmosphere. They were very, very close friends, always playing in the large gardens which we had. Frank eventually won a scholarship to attend the elite boys' school of Winchester College, where his rambunctious personality and brilliance at languages impressed a young Freeman Dyson, who marveled at Frank's interest in politics. Yeah, well, I was three years younger than Frank Thompson. So I arrived at Winchester College, the boarding school where we both were. I arrived as a shrimpy 12-year-old, and, and he was already a rather strapping and, and a bumptious 15-year-old, and so threw his weight about a great deal. He was somebody I got to know pretty well. He was the most lively, the most exciting person in the room. We, we the boys were divided up in, in what we call chambers. We were in second chamber, which meant about 10 boys of varying ages all the way from 12 to 17. So Frank Thompson was somewhere in the middle. From the school where they both were, they were at a school, a uh, primary school in Oxford. Uh, Frank went to Winchester and my brother, Brian, went to uh, Eton. And um, they were very popular boys there, I think, and uh, good at, quite good at their work, but full of fun and enjoying games and uh, making no bones about their communist ideas and interests, because uh, in Brown, my brother's uh, family, there were five boys, four of them older than him, and all of them by then were in the Young Communist League or the Communist Party. So they took it for granted that uh, sensible, interesting, jolly people were in the communist movement, and they went on like that at school. And I think Frank was quite open about his communist views at Winchester. And I, uh, I have vivid, vivid, vivid memories of his loud voice and his uh, strong opinions about all kinds of subjects. What else do I know about him? Of course, the other thing was he was a communist, which was also exciting. I wasn't a communist, but still I found it exciting to have somebody who had really some passion about politics. Being a communist wasn't just being a member of the party, it meant that you had your life and soul in, in it, and as he did, he really believed that the future of mankind was bright, and it was his, his job to bring it into existence. So he had a personal responsibility for saving the world, which of course was very contagious. Of course he had this passion f for obscure languages, which I shared, and he, he had sort of founded a club for studying obscure languages. So the, 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 the purpose was to especially to learn how to curse in as many languages as possible. Um, 
so he had this training in languages, and he became extremely proficient in a number of European languages. Um, this was partly at Oxford, where he went for only a year after he went to Cambridge, after he went to Winchester College. Um, in the long vacation, um, before he went to Oxford, he went on a dig in Crete, uh, well, an excavation in Crete of ancient Crete civilization, and here he began to learn modern Greek. Uh, and then at Oxford, and then in the army, he began to learn Russian, uh, he learned Italian, he learned Polish, and then he began to learn Serbo Croat and, of course, Bulgarian. So that he had, I think, something like nine languages, not, not proficient in all of them. Obviously, he only knew a little Bulgarian. When he went to Bulgaria, he learned more during the partisan struggle. After graduating from Winchester, Frank Thompson won a fellowship to attend Oxford University in 1938. There, he made the acquaintance of an intriguing Irish girl who hated fascism even more passionately than Frank. Her name was Iris Murdoch. And one evening, while Frank was flirting with her, she challenged him to join the Communist Party of Great Britain. Frank later reported, I was dumbstruck. I'd never thought of it before. Right then, I couldn't see anything against it, but felt it would be wise to wait till I sobered up before deciding. So I said, come to tea in a couple of days and convert me. Then I staggered home and lay on a sofa, announcing to the world that I'd met a stunner of a girl and was joining the Communist Party for love of her. But next morning, it still seemed good. I read State and Revolution, talked to several people, and made up my mind. Although he was not eligible for the draft until his 20th birthday, Frank Thompson volunteered for military service on September 1st, 1939, two days before the official British declaration of war against Hitler. Both his parents and Iris Murdoch were desperately opposed to his enlistment, but Frank was determined to fight. He wrote a poem to Iris Murdoch, explaining his decision. Sure, lady, I know the party line is better. I know what Marx would have said. I know you're right. When this is all over, we'll fight for the things that matter. Somehow today, I simply want to fight. That's heresy? Okay. But I'm past caring. There's blood about my eyes and mist and hate. I know the things we're fighting now and loathe them. Now's not the time, you say? But I can't wait. Thompson started out in the Royal Artillery. He set sail for the Middle East in March of 1941 as part of a unit called Phantom and was stationed in Cairo. After Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941, Frank was transferred to Syria. Frank was then sent to the Western Desert in North Africa and then back to Syria, Iraq, and Persia. Throughout the war, Thompson was an avid diarist and penned many letters to his parents, to his younger brother, and to Iris Murdoch providing an incredible documentary record of his personal experiences of the war. Reading through his journals and copious correspondence, one can feel Thompson's idealism, his support of the working class movement, and his belief that a better world would emerge from the ashes of the Second World War. A gifted polyglot with a passion for poetry, Frank Thompson dreamed of a future full of equality, brotherhood, and peace. Frank's unit participated in the Sicilian landings in June of 1943. Although he survived unscathed, he witnessed the deaths of many of the men in his unit. After Sicily, Frank was sent to Libya. His letters and diary entries show that he was restless and frustrated with the Allies for not opening a second front. The Soviets were taking heavy losses in the East, but Churchill was refusing to move. In April of 1943, Frank heard about the Special Operations Executive, SOE, a new unit that sent British officers in to work together with local resistance movements in the Balkans. The strongest of these partisan movements was in Yugoslavia, where Tito was successfully wreaking guerrilla havoc on the Germans. In Greece, there were both communist and nationalist partisans who were trying to liberate the country from Nazi and Bulgarian occupation. The SOE was looking for someone to work with the partisans in Bulgaria. There was little quality information about their numbers and effectiveness, although they were credited with several successful acts of sabotage. Partisan bands had removed train tracks, disrupting Nazi supply lines into Greece. If the SOE could establish contact with the partisans, equipping them with arms and other essential supplies, 
The British hoped that partisan detachments would grow in size and inspire a local peasant uprising against the Nazi-allied Bulgarian monarchy. Since Frank spoke Russian and had taught himself Bulgarian, he was the ideal officer for the mission. Thompson parachuted into Bulgarian-occupied Serbia in late January 1944. From the beginning, the mission was plagued with logistical difficulties. By the spring of 1944, the Bulgarian gendarmerie had stepped up their reprisals against partisans and their families by burning houses and promising other harsh punishments for anyone who collaborated with or gave food to the bands operating in the mountains. The Bulgarian Minister of Interior also placed a large bounty on the head of any dead partisan. Local villagers soon formed mercenary hunting parties. Simultaneously, bad weather and miscommunications prevented regular British supply drops. Thompson and his band of partisans were constantly on the run. In Bulgaria, Создаван на партизанско движение е много трудно. И затова двете бригади, които тръгнаха от Югославия, без да разберат каква е обстановката в България, ги разбиха на бързо. Тето и Томсън. Томсън, защото разликата е много голяма. Това е все едно като Ботевата чета. Едно време против Турците. Но какво имаме ние, партизани, в нашия край, с едни пушки от 23-та година от септемринското въстание и другите и не знаеш тия дали куршуми да са годни да гръмнат или не. Тръгваш така. И с това оръжие 20-30 души идва конен полк, идва джандармерия да ни унищожава, да се бори с нас. Това в главата му човек не може да се побере. Значи ние сме там толкова души, тъй да конен полк, идват джандармерия, всичко и какво остава. Въпреки всичко, те не искат да влезат по пирин на гора. Страни! Защото и на тех не им се умира. Но никой не му се умира. При тази обстановка. Е това жестоко наистина. И турците не са палили така къщите, както сега фашистите палки. Да, защото запариха къщата ли те са? След като ни бяха запалили къщата вече. И турците така не са правили. Всичко за изгоря. И тук трябва да имаш огромна воля и вяра в тази идея, че си велика и ти си част от тия борби за тази лева идея за прогресивно. He has in this letter several references to Homer and to Aeschylus, and the, the feeling is that the heroism of ancient Greek heroic literature is being echoed by the partisan struggle. There is this feeling that the two uh, are of the same quality. In mid-May of 1944, Thompson was safely encamped with some Serbian partisans in the liberated zone along the Bulgarian-Serbian border. Then an order came from Moscow that all Bulgarian partisan brigades should make their way to Plovdiv, a city in the center of Bulgaria. Although the Serb partisan general warned that it would be a suicide mission, Frank Thompson's orders were to stay with the Bulgarians. He tried to radio SOE headquarters for clarification, but received no reply. In the end, Frank Thompson accompanied the partisans of the 2nd Sofia Brigade on their final fateful march. It was a disaster. Desperately on the run and without regular supplies, the partisans were forced to eat grass and raw snails. On May 31st, after marching for almost two weeks without proper rest, Frank Thompson and the Bulgarian partisans collapsed in a clearing outside the village of Batulia to sleep. They were soon discovered and surrounded. Many were shot. Frank Thompson and several others were taken prisoner and interned. After being tortured and questioned, Thompson was held for weeks as World War II raged on. By June of 1944, the Soviet army was making steady westward progress and the beaches at Normandy had been stormed. As per the Geneva Convention, Thompson was a uniformed British officer and should have been treated as an official prisoner of war. Instead, for reasons shrouded in mystery to this day, Thompson was shot and killed. 
Some believe that Thompson was the first victim of the emerging Cold War. Others argue that Thompson's life was just one of many squandered in the fight against fascism, and that his left idealism was inconsequential to his sacrifice. Even now, Thompson's life and death remain enigmatic. Yeah, the first I heard of the death of Thompson was in the spring of 1945. The war was still going on. I was then working for Bomber Command in a safe office job. And we heard Thompson was dead. It came as a terrible shock. And yet the, the, the news came through a Bulgarian trade union representative, a lady, I forget her name, Sharova or some such name. Uh, she came to London to a conference of trade union people. And she had this story about how Frank had been tried in front of the, the villagers and had stood up so firmly and shouted, I die for freedom, or uh, heroic words, and gone to his death. And so that was the first we heard of it. And of course, to me, it came uh, as a, a reproach. I mean, I, I had been protected as a scientist while Frank was out there getting killed. So I felt terribly not only sad, but guilty for having survived. And I always wanted to learn more about how, what, what really happened in Bulgaria. Well, we had heard nothing then for a long time. And then I published in, in my book, Disturbing the Universe, an account of what I knew, mostly from this trade union dele delegate. So, and then I began to get responses from various people, in particular from E.P. Thompson, who was the younger brother of Frank, who had also been trying to collect information as to what had happened to him. So we got into correspondence. And of course, uh, E.P. Thompson had suspicions that the British government was hi hiding some deep and dark secrets, which may or may not be true, we just don't know still. But uh, he failed to get any information from the British government as to what really happened. In the meantime, there were various other reports out of Bulgaria which told very different stories. So there are several different versions of what really happened, and we still don't know which is true. During the communist era, Frank Thompson and his fellow partisans were celebrated and honored as heroes in the fight against fascism. In 1949, his mother and brother visited Bulgaria as the special guests of Georgi Dimitrov, and E.P. Thompson spent many years pondering the mystery of his elder brother's demise. Today, in Bulgaria's capital city of Sofia, there is still a street named after Major Frank Thompson, and in the municipality of Svoga, there remains a village named in his honor. But after 1989, Few people remembered who he was or what he gave his life for. Well, I can't remember how I initially found out about him because I, my first memory of probably being aware of him is reading his poetry, but that, um, I'm not sure if that was before or after I read about him in um, the Peter Conradi Iris biography, um, where he described their relationship and there were lots of excerpts from their letters and from his poetry. And I remember finding that book in my grandmother's house in Worcester. Um, so I must have been around 18 or so. Um, and I was just completely fascinated by the whole story. And yeah, it was just absolutely amazing. And he just seemed so much, he, he just seemed like a completely unrecognisable person compared to anybody I knew. Um, and I remember it, it just really deeply affected me because it seemed like, like a lot of people have the same reaction about Frank, I think they just think, could I have ever behaved in that way when I was his age or at the time I was younger, but it just, it seemed like a completely different sort of frame of reference, that he would be so, so much less selfish or self-absorbed than I was at the time. So Frank's vision of the communist ethics that was, of course, highly romant romanticized. But, I mean, it was a very real vision that, that the working people of the world would 
finally throw off the oppression of these capitalists who were holding them down. So it was a, a rebellion against the establishment which would liberate all this feeling of brotherhood and which was very real. And, and so he, he had this so utopian vision of what could be achieved. And he, he, he wrote this wonderful letter of, it's saying there is a spirit in Europe which describes Frank's view of things that, that these heroic partisans that he got to know in Bulgaria were the wave of the future. They were the people who would fin finally make Europe into what it should be, a brotherhood of nations with people running their, their, their own lives. Yeah, well, it just does seem to, nowadays, I don't know when it started because I wasn't around, but it seems to be just such a dirty word now to just definitely to, you know, to have described yourself as a communist, but even to be left wing. I mean, I find it kind of alarming that policies now that you would have thought were like reasonably centrist are now considered to be like really far left policies and also it seems to be currently linked to some kind of like radical you know like the terminology has just sort of been flipped over the years you know somebody would describe themselves as you know a radical historian but now if somebody is if you describe somebody as like a radical left-wing you know intellectual you, that has really sort of got negative connotations very very few people would consider you to to really be rational if you were left wing, I think. Today, Frank Thompson's remains rest in a grave in Bulgaria shared with 11 other Bulgarians, two of them named members of the Bulgarian Communist Party and nine of them unknown. On a plateau above the grave, there is an obelisk to those who died fighting fascism. There too, one can find the name of Frank Thompson mixed among those of his Bulgarian comrades. Just in the last Two months, my my colleague here in Princeton. I'm now a retired professor in Princeton. Uh, my colleague Jonathan Haslam, who is a historian, succeeded in getting a whole file declassified in London. A file belonging to SOE, that is the Special Operations Executive. So this was the secret undercover operations during World War Two. And their files finally are being declassified after 70 years. So we do have a little bit of documentation from them. And I have a package of papers which, which uh, John, Jonathan extracted. It doesn't tell you really what happened. Essentially, it's just correspondence in, in the SOE headquarters. They themselves don't seem to know what happened. So it's essentially there's nothing there that answers the questions that we all are still asking. Yeah, I would I would love to know what really happened. Um, and I know that Edward really, you know, he really, really, really needed to know and he never found out. And um, that must have just been absolutely hideous for him. Yeah, it just doesn't really seem to add up because they didn't really have any overt reason to kill him and it was clear that he had you know there was no way that it wasn't recognized that he was a British officer in uniform um, and so I yeah I would really love to know what happened um, and I think that you know for Edward he really seemed to be convinced that there was I think his expression was somebody winked so he obviously believed that it was either sanctioned sort of implicitly or explicitly by the British government. They, they decided that Frank was somehow either expendable or actively undesirable. Nobody really knows. Or, you know, some people say that they were getting, you know, the British were getting the Bulgarians to do their dirty work because for whatever reason they didn't want Frank coming back. I don't know, I mean, I was really young when Edward died, so I never spoke to him about it, but I feel personally like I don't know what answer he would have liked, because if it is the case that Frank was murdered with the, you know, with the approval or even at the, you know, at the orders of 
people in the British government, then that would attach a much, you know, a higher significance to his death. You know, which I don't know, I don't know if that would be better than if he had just been killed because somebody was on a power trip and they realised they could because, you know, the, the climate was changing and they just felt like it. Or, you know, the Bulgarians didn't like him because he was very popular with the local people. You know, it could have been anything and I don't really know which, I don't really know, I don't really know what answer I would like to find. I think that he was, um, even before uh, I was conscious of his existence, I think he was an influence um, on my life and, and on the lives of my brothers um, and the whole family in a sense because he was such an influence on my father. He was this um, adored older brother who had not only died but died in this extraordinarily heroic way. There was a, um, there was a whole story around around his death and this mock trial, which I think turns out probably not to have been true, but which my father believed up until the day he died because he was never, he didn't ever get a, a more accurate version of the story. And um, so it was really like this sort of hero figure um, in my father's life, which I think um, was a huge influence on him and on his passion for um, for creating a better world. I, I It's quite interesting. I felt, Frank's ghost kind of re reappearing in my life from time to time, often at, at obvious times when I would be going through old family papers or photographs or whatever. But I think that the recent interest in, in him actually has has pacified his ghost quite a lot. I think that um, Conradi's book and probably yours, um, bringing him into the public eye um, and the whole all the events around his death um, and, and that sort of episode in the war um, is maybe what he was hanging around waiting to what, waiting to happen um, and I don't feel his presence in the way that I did even 10 years ago and that emotional sense of yeah it was quite, um, quite a powerful sense of of, of of loss and of well I suppose of his yeah of his presence really um, and now it doesn't seem to be around so much. Just tell our story simply to those we shall not see. Tell those who will replace us. We fought courageously.